This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Drinking with Authors. I am your host, Erica Lance. Co-hosting today with me is the amazing and intrepid Mark Muncy from Erie, Florida. How and is today, everybody today? They're, they're all going to reply. I'll give them a moment to do that. Yeah, going to reply. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Our guest today is Matt Forbeck. Woo! Hi, folks. <laughs> okay. So um, I, let's talk about what we're drinking first. So I grabbed a couple of Founders Breakfast Stouts. Ooh, good stuff. They have a small baby eating oatmeal on it. And it's supposedly double chocolate coffee oatmeal stout. This sounds like I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm kind of good with that. <laughs> That's Mark, nice what stuff. are you drinking? Uh, well, as always, uh, since I'm on my seizure meds, uh, I'm doing wonderful coffee shop of horrors. This one I picked up uh, last week. This is Caramel Scream. Uh, which is a wonderful dark roast with a caramel blend. And oh my gosh, is it tasty goodness. So I'll be up all night too. That's true. Wow, I like the cup. The cup. We're not going to describe the cup because people need to watch the YouTube to get yep. the cup. It's the YouTube. Okay. Very yeah. Halloween-y, let's put it that way. So. Very, well, look at his ridiculous shirt he has on I love too. it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he is definitely in the spirit of the season. That's if cool. you're a Florida yeah. writer and you write horror and folklore and monsters or role-playing, you get you get a lot of creepy Hawaiian print shirts, imagine. I that. don't blame you a bit. <laughs> it's, Matt, uh, I am drinking, drinking a Wisconsin Special, which is the New Glare Spotted Cow. So oh. only available in Wisconsin. Actually, maybe folks from around the country don't know that, but it's probably the most popular beer in the state in a lot of ways. But it's uh, they had the opportunity to go national and decided, no, we're just going to make enough to sell to Wisconsin. So every now and then somebody will bring a barrel over to a bar in Minneapolis or something, and then they will actually get prosecuted for selling the beer over there because you're not you can grab it and bring it home, but you're not allowed to go sell it in a bar. So uh, people will say, if you're coming back from Wisconsin, bring me a case of New Glarus. So that's what I got here. Nice. Well, now I'm going to have to try that next time I'm up in Wisconsin, which I have been to Wisconsin because I actually did two years of high school in Wisconsin. Ah, cool. I took We're a at? class called Wisconsin, it's Green Lake. Yep. Do you know where that is? Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I know where that is. I'm probably, yeah, there's so many. It's most of the names in Wisconsin are either Native American names or they're like the most prosaic names like, you know, Bull Moose Lake or whatever, or Waters Meat in Michigan. Green Lake, I think, is. It's outside of Berlin. Right. Okay. Uh, you mean outside of New Berlin? Or I Berlin, Wisconsin? I remember it being Berlin. There we go. There's a little city called New Berlin, Wisconsin, which is on the way up uh, I-43 from my hometown, Beloit, up to Milwaukee. And actually, my my son's my eldest son's girlfriend's from New Berlin, right? And you can tell it's a, it's not Berlin. It's New Berlin, because that's how we pronounce things. We, we murder them here. So. Yep. Yes. They, Berlin had a, an ice skating rink. That was the talk of the town. That's what we did mm. every weekend. Because Green Lake doesn't even have a McDonald's or a stoplight. That's how yes. tiny that town was. <laughs> that's the classic I, Wisconsin town. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in um, Hollywood, California, and then moved there. So let me just say how well that went for me. That's, that's a culture <laughs> shock, to be sure. <laughs> oh, don't you know? It was a culture oh, yeah. shock. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, there. You know, we're talking to Charlie Barron's over here. He's one of the best comedians in the area. You know, he's just, he's, have you seen Charlie Barron's? He's this guy who's been doing it for about 10 years now. He's from UW, and he goes, Oh yeah, he just does this real Manaqua kind. He's got the mana, what is it, the uh, Manaqua Minute or something like that, or the Manitowash Minute, and uh, he's got T-shirts. I actually saw one. I was up in Northern Wisconsin this weekend in Menominee visiting one of my kids, and this woman comes out with a T-shirt says "Go Packers and fuck the Bears," you know. So <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> That's epic. Love it. Oh my gosh! But the, I don't know if you know this, Mark. The invention of the ice cream sundae is from Wisconsin. I learned um, that in Wisconsin history. That's good. Nothing about the Indians or anything no. that actually settled no, no. there. <laughs> nothing, nothing important. No. Now, my hometown's actually where Taylor Freezer is from. So if you ever had soft serve ice cream in your life, most of those machines came from his hometown here. So wow. Yeah, we, we're we're good at snack foods and beer, really. That's about and, and games, actually. You know, uh, Dungeons and Dragons was first published out of Wisconsin, right? About 40 minutes up the road from me. Yeah, I've been to Lake Geneva many a time for yep, there you go. That's how I got involved in all this shit. I grew up uh, 
you know, 40 minutes away. So when I was a kid, I would go play games in Lake Geneva, go to the conventions, all that kind of stuff. And that's how I got involved doing D&D. You know, if I grew up in L.A., I'd have probably gotten into film. You know, or if I grew up in New York, I might have gotten into traditional publishing. But you grew up in southern Wisconsin in the 80s, you get into role-playing games. That's how it works. <laughs> we don't have any choice over these matters. It just happens. I was there. Yeah. So too, I actually didn't start um, role play until I left Wisconsin and moved to Florida, and that's when I started D and D. Back back when you could parry the ma- the fireball with the mage, I miss those times. <laughs> Much better rules. Sorry. <laughs> Everybody thinks the rules they started out are the best. That's how it works. Too, right? Well, I actually think those were terrible rules. I miss for the the two point five. We're going totally off topic, but I miss. Forgotten Realms in 2.5. I thought that was a great, but like my kids and stuff, I'm like, Thacko, they're like, have no idea what that means. Right, exactly. Know. It's all mystery to them at this point. Mm-hmm. I started actually, I started playing on uh, basic D&D and then moved into AD&D, first edition. And then uh, I started writing for second edition Dungeons and Dragons back when I was in college. <laughs> and then worked on a bunch of third edition stuff. And uh, you know, then I wrote a bunch, I wrote Dungeonology, which was a, uh, you know what the Ology series is? Like Spyology, Dragonology, mm-hmm. huge best-selling series. People who published that licensed Dungeons and Dragons for a book and then hired me to write the Dungeonology, which was basically the Forgotten Realms uh, as a big fold-out book with pop-up maps and stuff. And I also wrote recently uh, six of the Endless Quest books, which are the Choose Your Own Adventure type books, right? The Pick a Path books. There we go. Mark's got yeah. one right there. I had to get that one. It was Ravenloft. That's, that's exactly. Like, if you're I, a I horror writer, that's Ravenloft that's your thing, man. So. I was in high school, so, yeah. Okay, not gonna lie. The first round of Ravenloft was terrifying. If your characters got thrown into Ravenloft, you're fucking dead. I'm sorry, you were just fucking dead. <laughs> Didn't matter if you made a character in Ravenloft, you had a chance of survival. But if you were anywhere else and ended up in Ravenloft, <laughs> kind of like Mr. Nor, fucking just burn the pages. Like there's oh, no yeah. point in existing anymore. <laughs> There was a, a thing going on Twitter recently where people were like, oh, you're killing a character is a serious moral thing. You have to do it very story oriented. I'm like, sure, if you play that way, very true. On the other hand, Tomb of Horrors, right? <laughs> Which we just <laughs> slaughtered everybody you walked into. So, and that was a lot of the fun. And you just rolled up another character the next day. Yep. Of course, then we were just rolling characters. We weren't coming up with like backstories and family trees and all the other stuff, which well, is great. I, mean, I love that stuff. That's but where they landed. <laughs> it's a different oh, approach. This guy's a door. Oh my gosh, this is fun, gaming nerds. Oh yeah, I was totally. explaining to somebody the other day because they showed me a new red box. I guess Dungeons and Dragons re-released the red box, right? But I was like, I didn't save mine, but I'm like, did it come with dice you had to color in with a crayon? No, they like, no, they're what? all professionally inked nowadays, so it's yeah. very different. And I'm like, they're like, what are you talking about? I have them still somewhere. Those dice that you had to color in. Oh yeah, they're still in I my bag. The twenty sided die only had one through zero on it, right? So you had yep. to do two different colors so that one was the tens and one was the the ones. And the first box I ever played in was uh, uh, God, it was pre Mulvey. What the hell was it? The Eric Holmes set, right? So it was a blue book cover, yep. and it didn't even have dice in it. It had a uh, a sheet of chits, like little counters, and you had to actually pop those out and then throw them in a cup. An opaque cup, and if you had to roll a d20, you reached in the cup and pulled out one of the 20 counters that would tell you what your number was, right? Oh, yeah, it was the, crazy because wow. you couldn't oh, find polyhedral dice edition. back in those days. Yeah. But I'm an old man. This is, yeah. <laughs> oh. I tell my kids, are like, and yeah, and you chiseled your homework with a you know, with a <laughs> hammer and a chisel, and it, it was all done in angles and shit. So, walked up both in, up, 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 we had to work the, the game farm. uphill both ways in the same exactly. <laughs> We had to work the farm. We didn't have homework. Exactly. You know, married School? at 12. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a whole nother story. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> my like, goodness. I don't know no. where you're going there, Erica, but, you know, it's all good. So. Yeah, it's, that used to be a thing. It wasn't even oh, that yeah. many years ago. Jeez. Okay. So, Matt, when did you start? I love this show. When did you start writing? Uh, you know, I started writing uh, when I was in high school. I was on the school newspaper. I started, you know, did other stuff and stories when I was a kid. Um, and then I started professionally writing. Uh, I actually have a creative writing degree from the University of Michigan, right? So, uh, you know, I actually got to use it, unlike a lot of other people with creative writing degrees. Um, so I started out, the reason I got into creative writing was at University of Michigan, I had uh, signed on to do an electrical engineering computer science degree and a creative writing degree. 
both of them simultaneously. I was going to finish in five years total, right? Because uh, I come up with some AP credits and I, I took an extra term or whatever during the summer. I'm like, oh, I can do this. I got them approved by the deans of both colleges. And about two years into it, I was start struggling with circuits. And I'm like, yeah, I just finished fourth term calculus. I'm like, I'm miserable. I, you know, the whole point is that you're going to do this electrical engineering, computer science stuff. And then you're right in the evenings, right? You'll get a job with the safe shit. And then you're right in the evenings and eventually you'll make the transfer over. I'm like, you know, I'm lazy. I'm going to come home. I'm going to go drinking with my buddies. I'm going to go see my girlfriend. I'm going to play a game. I am never going to get around to doing the writing part. I just wasn't disciplined enough to do that. So I said, fuck it. I dropped out of engineering. Uh, my parents persuaded me to finish out the term as opposed to just dropping it entirely. So I, cause the credits were already paid for. And uh, I got out with my creative writing degree in three years total actually. And then uh, decided that if I fucked it up within the next, you know, three to five years, or whatever, I could go back and finish the engineering degree. But that was uh, 1989. So 32 years ago. So I think I'm screwed at this point. I'm kind of stuck where I am. Right. Um, oh, I don't, yeah, no, I think you should go back to college immediately. Yeah, you're exactly. an epic failure at this. I mean, clearly, I don't even know why you're on this podcast. Clearly, I've washed out entirely, and I need to go back to learning Fortran, which is what I was doing. <laughs> well, at first, when you were telling the story, I'm like, he's going to talk about being a game designer. And then I was like, no, that just went left. Okay. Never yeah, well, I did both, right? I'd actually, when I was in college, I ended up uh, meeting a guy named Will Niebling, who was actually the original vice president of sales for TSR were the original publishers of Dungeons and Dragons. And Will was the biggest Michigan fan in the world, right? So uh, Troy Denning introduced us. Troy had been working at TSR. Now, Troy's writing, he wrote shitloads of Halo novel or Star Wars novels. Now he's writing Halo novels. Um, and he and I were both writing Halo novels at the same time a few years ago, which was kind of fun. Um, and Troy's one of my mentors. You know, I knew him since I, I actually met him at my first Gen Con. I met uh, Will at my first Gen Con when I was uh, 14 years old, just turned 14, I think. It was 1982. And I've been to every Gen Con since then. That was Gen Con 15. Uh, and I've been a guest of honor for like the last 15 years. And you know, I have a great time there. Um, but uh, Will got me into doing sales repping for these game companies. So I was working for Iron Crown Enterprises, Grenadier Models, and Coplog Games, and Mayfair Games, and a bunch of other ones. And I would stand in booths and sell people games, right? But the entire, there's downtime. So like, while I'm not selling somebody a game, I'm going over to the CEO of the company going, hey, you need somebody to write something for you? You need somebody to edit something? I could get anything with words. I can help you take care of, right? And you know, they're like, well, okay, we'll give you a little thing, kid. And, you know, I eventually ended up moving up. Uh, I started doing, the first thing I think I got paid for public uh, for writing was writing the rules to a game called Myth Fortunes, which was a board game that Mayfair published based upon the funny fantasy novels by Robert Lynn Aspen, the Myth Adventure series, right? Which I was a huge fan of in high school. So I was like, oh, this is great. I got to meet Bob Aspen and, and uh, talk to game. And Will and his buddy, John Danovich had done the game design, but they didn't know anything about writing. So they hired me on to write the rules. And then just kind of spiraled from there. Uh, when I got out of college, when I was in college, I actually worked for Gary Gygax over at New Infinities, which was his second company mm -hmm. after TSR. And I edited novels, and I edited some game stuff. And yeah, like I found an unpublished Gary Gygax novel in my attic a couple of years ago, right? Wow. That was just sitting there that they had handed wow. to me. I'm like, oh, shit. And uh, his widow's like, I'll take that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, fine. It's yours anyway. It belongs to you. Um, and, uh, you know, so you're, you're interesting things where I got to do all this stuff. When I got out of college, I, uh, I wanted to go to Europe, but I didn't have any money. I was just fresh out of college. Uh, fortunately, my parents had managed to pay for college. So I, was, I didn't have a ton of debt, but I had no dollars at all. Uh, so I got a work visa, a student work visa in the UK and flew over there. And I had seen an ad in White Dwarf magazine. I said, I, not, I called up Games Workshop. I said, dudes, I'm here. Hire me. And they're like, who are you? What? what? <laughs> um, but I actually, I came up to the design studio I interviewed and I didn't realize this until years later. They didn't tell me, but I was interviewing against two other people. And I landed a job as an editor for Games Workshop for six months. And uh, just kind of balls my way into it. I uh, ended up working on a Deathwing uh, uh, and Gene Stealer, which were two supplements for Space Hulk, which is this great Warhammer 40,000 game. I worked on Blood Bowl and I worked on White Dwarf magazine yep. and such. And my roommate ended up being uh, this other guy who had just been hired a couple of weeks before that from Scotland. And his name was William King, Bill King who's now writing like, uh, you know, World of Warcraft novels and all sorts of other stuff. He wrote tons of novels for the Black Library for Games Workshop. But we were best friends and I lived with him for six months. We had a great time. Uh, but I had this girl back home who, uh, you know, this is back in the days before the internet, really. So 
uh, she's like, well, you know, we've been writing letters to each other and, you know, calling each other $3 a minute. And she's like, well, they offered me a full-time permanent position. And she's like, well, if we have to, if you're going to do that, you know, we're going to have to end this. We can't six months I could do, but, you know, potentially forever, not such a good idea. And I said, well, fine. Then I quit. So I, I came home um, and ended up with that girl. And that's been my wife of 29 years now and the mother of my five kids. So um, worked out pretty well for me. I think it was a good decision. But Well, that was, uh, I was going to say that. I hope that story goes in that direction. Yeah, exactly. you're like, I came back and she had another boyfriend. And then <laughs> you got real dark all of a sudden. Yeah, it got very <laughs> dark. That, but, <laughs> ooh, that escalated quickly. No, no. And then there was a murder. We don't talk about where the bodies are buried, but, you know, no, it's not there's no statute of limitations over, so we don't discuss those. Yeah, no, totally. Don't bring that up ever. <laughs> no, but I, I got into writing uh, freelance game design after that, and then I uh, um, I started my own company with a guy named Shane Hensley called Pinnacle Entertainment Group, which did Deadlands and Brave New World, a bunch of other RPGs. And while I was doing that, I started doing uh, writing novels. Right? Uh, I had I I'm like God, guys, I'm writing for Games Workshop. I'm writing stuff for TSR why are you, you have novel divisions? Why are you not hiring me to write novels? And they're like, well, because we don't trust you. You've never written a novel. And I'm like, well, that's a good point. I have one novel I wrote in college, which is absolute shit. And I'm not going to show it to anybody. Um, you know, we, we have to, you have a death vow. If you read that book, I've got a copy of a writer somewhere, uh, but my children have been sworn to silence about it. And, uh, you know, and they said, well, you know, we don't trust you to write a novel until you've written a novel right? We can't just give you an advance and whatever else in a contract if we don't know that you can write a novel. And I was bitching about this at some convention. It was either a Gamma Trade Show or the Origin Trade Fair, Gen Con or something. And a guy over here heard me and it was Ed Reaper, or I'm sorry, Ed Pugh over at Reaper Miniatures. And Ed says, what? You're kidding. Shit, Matt, I'll hire you to write a novel. <laughs> okay, Ed. So he hired me to write a novel for a game called CAV, Combat Assault Vehicle, which was their kind of battle mech version of yeah. uh, miniature games. And I wrote a 40,000 word, very short novel for them for Nickel Word. And I sent it to Ed, I emailed it to him. And the moment I emailed it to him, without even opening up the email, he FedExed me a check and I had it the next day, right? And then that, wow. that's the kind of guy you love. And then six months later, the book was on shelves because you know they're not traditional publishers. Like, oh, we got a book, boom, there you go. And uh, I turned around, I said, I waved it at Games Workshop and, and TSR, which was just being bought by Wizards in those days. And they said, great, let's talk. And like literally within a couple months after that, I'd sign on for two novel series with each of them. Right. Wow. Blood Bowl since. series is one of my all time favorite reads. Oh, thank you. It's, yeah, it's I had a blast working on it. I love that one. And that was one of the series. They, they signed me on for that one. It was like crazy. Well, this sounds like a very like fortunate path that you decided to go down because yeah, it's just or been, you were thrust been, down or you wrote down I, I think it's uh you know definitely a lot of it's been luck i mean the thing is i know there are a lot of plenty skilled writers out there just as much talent as i do that have not been as fortunate right and on the other hand i'm not as fortunate as some of my friends who have gone on to be new york times bestsellers regularly whatever it's all a perspective there, right? I feel very fortunate in the kind of career I've had. And I, you know, uh, my son, Marty, my eldest now is uh, becoming a role-playing game writer. He's looking at doing the same stuff I do. And I'm like, holy shit, Tiger. Uh, we have seen, I've got a wake of bodies of friends of mine that have, you know, washed out and behind me. And, you know, he's just spent his entire life watching me do this and have fun and not working for other people. He's like, I think I'd like to try that. I'm like, okay, we'll try it. We'll see what we can get you doing and see if we can have some fun. No guarantees in this. You know, I can't guarantee myself anything much less him anything but we're going to give it a shot for him so um but yeah it's been a lot of it's been just being lucky nowadays uh you know i actually swore off doing tie-in novels at one point because i was writing original novels and uh you know i'm like okay and i'm doing this and i'm doing kickstarters and i'm having a great time i'm having fun and that you know people come up they're like would you like to write halo novels i'm like i love halo so um <laughs> and would you like to write uh, i got to write the rogue one junior novel right for star wars and i'm like oh yeah i'll write that you know uh so you know things start coming your way you're like like right now i'm writing i just finished the first draft on the uh marvel tabletop role-playing game that's coming out uh playtest version in 2022 and then uh the full-on version in 2023 and, and you know, are, you, are you waving paraphernalia again think you got yeah, a lot see, to live up to there i'm there baby 20 years matt but i know you can so exactly um but you know and i, I 
I, I work on video games too. And a lot of this is just when you've been doing it for decades, people know you, they know your reputation, they know you can deliver on time. They know you're not going to flake out and take their money and run away and not be there when they need you. And so uh, nowadays, I almost never have to go looking for work. It just kind of shows up, which is kind of freakish, right? Uh, especially since I spent my early years as such a hustler trying to chase down every gig I could get, right? I ended up writing two editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia. And the reason I got that gig is I was just wandering around Comic-Con one year uh, looking for work. And I happened to stop by the DK publishing booth and saying, is there any editor here? Can I give you a business card? I'm a big fan of these kind of things. And like three months later, I get an email out of the blue saying, well, we're looking for somebody to uh, write a new edition of the Marvel Encyclopedia. Would you be up for that? I'm like, yeah, sign me up. So, um, so I think it's just putting yourself when... out there and some of it's just blind luck. You yeah. know, I think it's great. I call it when nerd dreams come true. I think a lot of what you have to do, though, is exactly what you said. I think a lot of creatives think they're going to be discovered as a creative or do something that thinks like somehow it's magically going to appear for you versus you having to hustle to get it and find people and meet people and do that sort of thing. And I, I say this regularly, like, you know, what you're describing is something a lot of people would like to walk into and be able to do and have all these things and all these, um, you know, I don't want to call them genres, but all these different Halo and Star Wars and stuff. People hear that and they're like, oh my God, you got to write Rob Wagner. But what it comes from is putting in the hard work to begin with and as making communications, like talking to people, like yeah. how valuable it is going and talking to people because they don't always have a million people lined up, but what they'll do is if they don't know who the hell you are, they're going to default to the people, like you said, that they know can deliver. But if you show up and go, this is who I am, blah, blah, and you show persistence, a lot of times they'll go, okay, fine, we'll give you a shot. I actually, I told my daughter, so she graduated early from high school. She was 16. And in Florida, you're not allowed to get a job at 16 without all these rules because the dropout rate in Florida was up to 60%. So they said, basically, businesses, if you don't do this thing where you find out, um, you have to go through all these steps to make sure the kid stays in school while you're hiring them, you can't hire them unless they're 18 years old. That was the rule. It's, it's still in place. It's really dumb. So she graduated, she graduated high school, but when people found out her age, they wouldn't touch it because of all this stuff. There were only a few companies. So she decided she was going to get a job at a movie theater and literally called them. I told her, I said, you're going to have to call until they stop telling you to call. And when they say stop calling here, don't. And it's very funny because her manager, who I met later, said she finally, by the 30th call or something, was like, okay, fine fine come in right. that was the whole thing just get, 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 come in here we don't even want to talk to you anymore we don't even care who you are just stop calling us and come in and work and and she did really well there but it was that persistence and i think a lot of people still wait like they send you know they write something and then they think everybody's going to come upon it in a magical forest with birds and unicorns and it's going to go this is the greatest work ever and it, it doesn't happen like that me genius isn't automatically recognized I'm <laughs> weird i know it's so weird it's well crazy. it's interesting you also the hell? <laughs> New York Times bestseller, but that that's like one stature but that doesn't mean you have a continued stature in that like you have to yeah. still work and do that i think it's a great thing but it's not a always thing no, yeah, it's like i was Started work with uh, tsr back in the day when i was writing dungeons and dragons stuff and editing dungeons and dragons stuff there's a guy named bruce hurd who was in charge of hiring all the freelancers. So I got to know Bruce real well. And I would call him up all the time. And I would say, hey, Bruce, how you doing? When are you guys planning out next year's products? Right? Because I know that's when you give out the work. When are you doing? He's like, well, we don't have anything right now, but probably six weeks from now. And I would just write it on my calendar. And I would call him up six weeks later. So Bruce, how you doing? Are you done there yet? Are you there yet? Nope. Nope. Uh, three weeks? I'll call you in three weeks. Right? And that meant, because part of the problem is not only do you want to be good uh, and persistent, but if you're not on their mind at the moment they're assigning those jobs, you don't get the work, right? It's going to be whoever is on their, the top of their list, right? Whoever happens to be in the top of their mind, really. And the way you would you manage to, to work your way around that is by being persistent, by saying, look, you now you need somebody. I'm the person who's been asking. I'm continuing to ask. I'm still available. Hire me. And that, that worked beautifully for me, right? Year after year. Very cool. Mark, were you going to say something? Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say that, you know, 
because my books have been on the New York Times bestseller list down at the bottom, but they made oh. it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and that's just it. It's like, I'm still big fish, little pond, you know, only certain people even know. So, you know, my name's not Stephen King, so nobody cares. Right, you know? right. I mean, my Marvel books, the two encyclopedias I wrote, they were, the second one spent six months on the New York Times bestseller yeah. list, right? Like really high up. It was like number five book on Amazon for a month or whatever over the holidays when you're, I'm like, great. And you know what? Nobody cares. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody cares. It's just, you know, it's but on the it, other it, hand, like James Patterson or Stephen King, you know. On the other hand, that's how I got the Marvel role-playing game gig because they're like, oh, Matt, you know. Also, the guy who was the publisher of Marvel Comics at the time was John Nee, who I had designed a collectible card game for back when he was a president or vice president of Wildstorm, uh, which was a division of Image Comics that Jim Lee ran, right? That was Jim Lee's part of Image Comics. So when they hired me to write, uh, to design games with them back in the early 90s, uh, then John moves on. He's uh, working at DC. He's a VP at DC. And then he's a publisher at Marvel. He's like, you know, we should do role playing games. I know just the guy, right? And it's just persistence okay. over time means that I get to be front of the line when that happens, right? Which is really very convenient for me. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but very convenient for me. So. No, no, it works out great. And it's like I love when I'm, you know, when I'm browsing a game or something like, or especially when the Kickstarters roll around and stuff, and I recognize some familiar names because, like I said, I've been around behind the scenes role-playing a long time too but uh yeah and it's always fun to see when i see your name on it something like that i'm like yeah. especially your time at uh, pinnacle uh, yeah i was a big yeah. fan of deadlands and, we put out uh, a boatload of books in those days <laughs> yeah crazy. yeah i mean and uh you know we were you know one of the early beta test teams for that and i would just ah, love cool. the quality of writing and everything in it so it was Thank it was you. a lot of fun and uh and, and, and hey i just Look over here. It was more toys. I've got your 20th anniversary edition. There you go. I had nothing to do with that. That's all Shane, but there you go. Your name's I left the company after about four or five years. So <laughs> we moved back to Wisconsin when we started having kids. Yeah. And then the company, uh, we split the company up. I ended up having a game I did called Brave New World, which is, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> hold on. Junior your fanboying, Mark. I swear hey, on these podcasts. I, I know. That's what it, yeah. Ooh. See, this is one of the other reasons I got the Marvel gig is I had done a superhero role playing game at one point yeah, in my a life. A good one too. Um, and this is a book we did for uh, for Pinnacle back in the day. Now I ended up selling that to Alverac Entertainment Group. I worked for them in the year. Rights have reverted to me, and I'm probably going to be running a Kickstarter for next edition of that. I was probably already going to do it, and then I got the Marvel gig. I'm like, well, I'm all, I don't really want to be designing two superhero games at the same time. So I'm going to focus on the Marvel game, then we'll get to this one after we're done. And maybe well, that's, be, Marvel yeah. probably wouldn't want you designing two superhero games. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care. They okay. care, but at a certain level, they don't. It's like uh, unless they sign you for exclusive, like a lot of their comic book writers write for both them and DC, or they have their own independent stuff, whatever. They sign you for an exclusive. That means they pay you extra money or more regular money, and then you cannot do that kind of stuff. But for something like this, or like role playing games, we're not even sure what. what explain that to me again, right? So. Um, yeah, it, some people in the company are very deeply into role-playing games, really understand them, got a great handle on them. Some people are like, we barely understand comics because we came over from Disney and we don't know what the hell this is. But we know how to sell superhero shit, so we're going to do this. So. And there's not a superhero Marvel game now, so we need a new Marvel game for superheroes. So. Yep. Yeah, it hasn't been since Margaret Weiss did one back about yeah. 10 years ago. I actually worked on that one, too. I think it was almost 20 day. years ago, the saga rules, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's been a while. Um, so I'm excited about it. I've been having a lot of fun working on the game too. It's yeah. tough. Very cool. Okay. We have to take a quick break. We will be right back with Drinking with Authors. Good, because I'm done with this one. I need another. <laughs> Sample locally sourced, quality distilled spirits in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge at Skunk Brothers Distillery. We're family owned, brewing small batch grain to bottle spirits, just like our grandfather did back in the Prohibition era. From handcrafted bourbons and moonshine to flavored blends and cordials infused with local fruit. Join us for a tasting tour and buy Skunk Brothers spirits straight from the source. It's all in the family at Skunk Brothers Spirits located in Stevenson, Washington. Okay. We're, We're back. Number Mark, two. What, what is that one? It says, says Brooklyn Oktoberfest. A friend of mine who grew up the street from me uh, is now like president or vice president of Wisconsin Beer Distributors in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, he and his, his brother, who was uh, one of the guys who taught me how to play Dungeons and Dragons, worked for the company. And every time I see them, they're like, you should try some of this new stuff we have. <laughs> and they just hand me like six packs of stuff. I'm like, so I saw Mike Trudgeon recently. His brother Casey is the, the VP there. And they handed me some of this stuff. And I'm like, well, I'd be happy to fall on that grenade for you. If I have, yeah, you've got good friends. I'm just going to throw I'm that out there. 
Some it's, very good friends. Uh, you're okay. trying to network with people. It, you know, people think networking is all about uh, you know meeting CEOs and shit like that, but it's really about making friends. And then you coming through for your friends when you can and them doing vice versa, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. No, totally. Trust me, it's not. The CEOs are not the ones making most of the decisions most of the time. Yeah, exactly. Amen. And you know, the funny part is if you start meeting people at the, at the bottom, by the time you're in your 40s, 50s, whatever, your friends are CEOs suddenly, right? So it's not such a bad thing. Like Very I just worked at a video game called Biomutant that came out back in the spring, right? And the guy there, Stefan Lundquist, is... Uh, I met him doing tabletop role-playing games back in the 90s out of a, with a group called Target Games out of Sweden. And uh, then I had worked with him for Avalanche Studios, which does Just Cause and a bunch of other games. And we worked on a game that never got, it never was actually published, right? We did a lot of conceptual work, whatever. And I did some other work for them on uh, Rage 2, which came out a few years ago. And so when Stefan went off to start his own company, uh, he's like, Matt, I need help with work. You're the guy. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, I'll jump in and help you whatever you need so it worked out pretty well nice. that's awesome okay mark before i ask matt about this lovely sign that's behind him were you rooting around for something else i feel like you have a box of magic tricks over there that you just like and let me put it's out endless bookshelf of gaming stuff here i mean i've got the uh, you know a deadlands box set i've got a couple other things over here but uh if i pull them out i'll just be showing off so it's okay. all good no i i'm just uh yeah, you know, it's it's one of those. It's like, all right, I was I was actually just looking to see if I had that Blood Bowl uh, box uh, book set next to me, and hmm. I'm like, oh man, I don't. It's somewhere in another shelf. So <laughs> but, I don't even have all my stuff up here. My we had uh, I this is my office, but I moved out of here for about a year because my mother in law moved in. She was you know having so hard time. I actually died over there about ten feet from uh, me back in June, right? Sorry, and now I've moved back into the office, but I've not reshelved everything so, yet. So it's been kind of nuts. Crazy year right <laughs> oh it's i i will say that it's unprecedented i do hr for my day job that's a bit of an understatement but i do hr and i'll tell you i could not there is no way i could have written this being an author myself that writes war stuff like i could not have written this to go the direction that it's gone if i did people would be like this is not unbelievable this is garbage yeah. like people don't act that way what are you talking yeah. about People would have been, there won't be a toilet paper shortage. What are you thinking, crazy person? Right. Like, Is this Russia in the 90s? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bizarre. Okay. So let's talk about this lovely sign behind you, shall All we? Right. So oh. this thing here is called Shotguns and Sorcery. When I was, uh, uh, when I was uh, 32 years old or some such, they did a world search for Dungeons and Dragons where they're like, for third edition, like, we want to come up with the next new world for Dungeons and Dragons. And they're like, everybody can turn in a one page paper, you know, see if you get selected. So I turned in a few of them and none of them got selected, of course, because, you know, it's 10,000 entries. My friend Keith Baker won. And I'm like, for Eberron, he created Eberron, right? Which is fantastic. And then they hired me to write a trilogy of novels right at the same time Keith was writing it. So we were writing the first two trilogies of novels for that, which was a blast. So no, yeah, I didn't feel bad about this at all. But I had this idea for this thing called Shotguns and Sorcery, which is essentially this uh, fantasy noir universe where uh, zombies have swept over the entire continent. And as they came up to the last mountain where the dragon was on, he, uh, the free peoples who had managed to survive so far come up and say, dragon, we want to cut a deal. We want you to protect us from the zombies long enough for us to put a wall up around the mountain. And if you could do that, we'll give you whatever you want. He says, that's fine as long as I get to rule over this little kingdom we've created. And now I am the dragon emperor. So, 500 years later, after all this has happened, we we're in Dragon City, which is where Shotguns and Sorcery takes place. And uh, I'd actually sold this as a third edition setting to Mongoose Publishing, right? And I remember sitting there with Matt Sprang at Gen Con and going, this is going to be great. It's going to go like this, da, da, da. And then my wife became pregnant with quadruplets, right? And we're like, and that just shot everything. I'm like, no, oh, well, I guess I'm not doing that right now. I got other things that are going to keep me a little bit busier. I was actually writing something for Forgotten Realms at the time. Uh, that was it? Un unapproachable East, I think, right? And oh, I called yeah. my editor, Rich Baker, and I go, Rich, uh, I'm going to be late on this. And he goes, Matt, you're never late. What's going on? I said, well, my wife's, I'm in the hospital with my wife right now. She's on full bed rest with drugged up to her eyeballs because she's got four babies inside of her. And he says, you take all the time you need, <laughs> right? Yep. Rich is a good guy. Um, but that meant that things like that kind of fell to the wayside. 
Um, so I just kind of shelved in and about 10 years after that, Robin Laws, who's an amazing game designer in his own right, was looking for people to uh, write short stories for these anthologies he was doing called The New Hero. And so I said, oh, I got this setting and I've never done anything with. Let me write up a short story for it. I did that. I wrote another short story. And then I liked it so much, I thought I should write some novels. In it. So, you know, I've been traditionally published as well. But then I had this crazy idea in 2012 to do this insane project called 12 for 12, where I was going to write a dozen novels in a year. Right. Oh, and, wow. How did that I'm go? A, I'm a pretty quick writer. I can write about 5,000 words a day when I'm cooking. Um, and uh, it went pretty well, actually. But I've said, OK, I can't afford to take a year off to write 12 novels. So I'm going to break them into four Kickstarters for a trilogy, four trilogies, run a Kickstarter for each. And then we'll go. Right. And uh, we ended up raising like something like sixty thousand dollars the whole thing. And uh, I managed to go off and write these books. I did not quite hit 12 novels that year. I wrote uh, nine novels for the 12 for 12 thing. I wrote a novel for the TV show Leverage because I'd helped set that up a few years before. And because uh, I knew the showrunner, John, John Rogers and uh, the guys over at Penguin said, hey, we just got the deal. Are you interested in writing a Leverage novel? I'm like, oh, OK, I'll write a Leverage novel. And I wrote uh, nine issues of the Magic the Gathering comic book for IDW and oh, a novella for StarCraft II for Blizzard. So, so I, didn't, I didn't succeed quite where I wanted to, but I, as I say, I failed, but I failed well, right? And I think that's part of it is set high goals for yourself. And if you screw it up, even if you fall short, it's going to look pretty good, right? Um, and eventually I managed to get all the books out the door and everybody was pretty happy. Uh, then... Uh, we had licensed them to, I, there was a guy who was doing these enhanced eBooks. He did something called steampunk Holmes, right? Which was a uh, steampunk Sherlock Holmes uh, book they did, but it had like animation and songs and sound and all sorts of wacky shit. And, you know, character profiles that pop up out of the eBook. And he said, I want to license shotguns and sorcerers for that. I said, great. And then they did a whole, uh, their second Kickstarter, the first Kickstarter raised like 60, $70,000, $90,000 huge at the time. And then uh, the, the second Kickstarter, which was for a line of like 15 novels, failed miserably, didn't fund at all, right? Like got like 10% of the goal they were looking for. And he's like, you know what? Boom. And he shut down the whole thing. But his VP of production was an artist who just adored shotguns and sorcery. He says, man, I want to do something with this. So he actually licensed it to produce this, which is the shotguns and sorcery role-playing game, which came out from Outland Productions right there. Oh, wow. Uh, and they, they licensed the Cypher system, which was a game designed by Monty Cook Games. Monty Cook is an old friend of mine. He was one of the main designers on third edition. Monty actually also edited the first ever big book I wrote for role-playing games, Western Hero, back when he was the Hero Games editor for Iron Crown back in the early 90s. So I've known Monty, Monty forever, and it was great fun to be able to work with this. Rob Schwalb, who's a great friend of mine, did the rules for this, uh, modifying the, the Cypher system rules. And uh, Rob has worked on fourth and fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons also does Shadow of the Demon Lord, which is a fantastic game, right? We also happen to share the same birthday for some God unknown reason. There we go. Um, and there was but, a good day in nerd um, that exactly. day. August 4th, folks. <laughs> Just remember that. Um, and so, you know, that they licensed it. They did the, uh, the game. I wrote the game. Uh, Rob did the rules. I did all the other stuff. Uh, and then they kind of screwed it up. I mean, it wasn't intentionally, but they had some personal things going on. The game took a long time to ship. It took about five years to ship. And it was supposed to take two, right? So um, eventually the license expired. And I looked at Jeremy Moeller, the guy who did this, who was the artist, who actually did that gorgeous cover, which you can see right here as well. Uh, and I said, Jeremy, I'd be happy to extend the license for you, but you look like you're doing other stuff right now. Maybe I should just take it back and we'll go our separate ways. You no, know, call it cool. And that's what we did, right? So we pledged to finish off the last bits of the Kickstarter together. I provide the writing, he provide the artwork, and then we move on. So we've done that. We actually have one last thing to do, which is an art book that I'm about halfway through light, laying out right now that I'm going to deliver to backers, hopefully either late this week or early next week. And then literally the week that we deliver that, we're starting a Kickstarter for the fifth edition version of Shotguns and Sorcery. So while all this has been going on, my son, Marty, who I talked about before, has been actually working on doing a fifth edition version of Shotguns and Sorcery. So the book's actually written. We have all that's done there, except I'm going to be adding some new fiction snippets to lead off each chapter in each section of the book. And uh, we, have all, we have all the artwork in. We have a couple of few pieces we still need to add that are new to, the, to this edition of the game. But we have a brand new cover that just came in from Jeremy yesterday. And uh, it looks fantastic. It's all the heroes from the books surrounded by zombies and swiping at them with uh, shotguns and swords and uh, wands and everything else. 
Um, and so we're going to launch a Kickstarter uh, starting, I think, let's see, it was originally 19th, it's going to be October 26th now. So uh, one week from tomorrow, we're recording this on the 18th of October. On October 26th, the uh, Kickstarter will launch. If people are interested in it, you go to shotgunsnsorcery.com. That will take you directly to the Kickstarter pre-launch page. And you'll get a notification that says, uh, as soon as we I push the launch button, an email will go out to you saying, hey, by the way, it started. Go, go, go. And we're trying to figure out if we want to do something special for people on that day one or not. And there's a lot of uh, arguments about whether or not it's a good thing to get everybody to jump in right away or if people who come in later then feel like they've been cheated. Right. And so you don't want to make feel like they're ever been cheated and think about maybe doing like, uh, you know, if you, if you back in the first few days, maybe your signed book will be numbered, you know, as opposed to not being numbered. So you actually get a little bit of prestige there, but it doesn't really affect anything, so to speak. Um, so we're, we're, I'm still debating about that. We'll have made a decision by, by next Tuesday, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, I'm really excited <laughs> about this. We got one of the things, you know, because the last game took so long to come out, we wanted to make sure that, uh, people knew they could trust us. I actually wasn't behind the last Kickstarter. It was you know, I licensed out to Outland. Uh, but I also know that those are my fans. And I didn't want to, uh, I didn't feel it would be right to just move on to something without making sure my fans were made whole, so to speak, right? And made uh, the people that were willing to put up money for that got what they had paid for. So this time around, to double make sure that there are no problems, we are, we've are we got a deadline for all this stuff that's like months past what we think we're going to be able to hit. And we've already got 90 to 95% of the product in hand already. Right. Oh, wow. So, uh, I mean, as far as text, really, it just me, needs me going through laying out the book, adding in the bits of fiction, and uh, getting a few extra pieces of artwork from Jeremy to cover the new things that we've included in this version of the game, which should not take very long. Most of it's already done. In fact, I'm planning to send out uh, a Word doc that's got a lot of this stuff in it, so people can start reading it when they pledge for it, and then we can get some right. playtest feedback on that and make sure that this is the best possible product it can be. All right. That's very cool. And I take this my game podcast design. will come out my writing, so. <laughs> timed for that. I bumped your podcast up because you had a release date. So I figured. I appreciate that. that, right? I know I'm always supposed to be, I'm, I'm shitty at marketing. I'm really good at networking, but I'm terrible at marketing, right? Uh, in fact, we're, I'm partnering with BackerKit to do the marketing on this because it's like, yeah, I can do that. But I'm, I'm just, I'm so busy doing the other stuff usually. Like I've got, uh, you know, 15 original novels that are out and mostly I'm just like, yeah, they're there. Go get them when you do. And I probably should be trying to push them, right? Um, but I'm usually too busy writing the next book to think about the older stuff, which is okay. sad. Like uh, my first three novels, the rights reverted to me from uh, Angry Robot a couple of years ago. And I've just been basically, as soon as I get a chance, I get these new covers, which a friend of mine gave me that uh, we swap some work for. And I can put them out. I'll put a Kickstarter. We'll do it. It'll be great. And I just, you know, between... Uh, family illnesses and all this kind of stuff and the pandemic and other crazy projects just haven't gotten around to it. So this, one of the reasons I'm doing this Kickstarter is because it says, God damn it, we're going to get this thing out the door, right? I want to make sure that Marty gets, you know, he's been working on this thing really hard. I want him to have his book out there that I'm working on with him that people can enjoy and play, right? So instead of letting it sit there while we have him do another three or four books or whatever, right? Um, so I'm very excited about it. I think it, people are really going to like it, hopefully. And again, because this was originally an idea for third edition Dungeons and Dragons, the fact that it's coming back to fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons is really bringing it whole circle, right? Uh, it was originally conceived of as a setting for D&D. &D. So to have written, you know, three novels, three short stories, uh, a comic book that came up with the last Kickstarter that I just delivered to backers last week, and, you know, a role-playing game. And now to bring it all the way back to fifth edition role, Dungeons and Dragons, I'm really excited about it. I think that's awesome. You know what you could offer is you could always offer to uh, host actual role-playing games. Yeah, that's actually, party, that might be one of our top game. tiers. Exactly. You know, uh, right. people often do that and say, like, you know, if you pledge ungodly amounts of money, we will yeah. then, you know, uh, set you up with a role-playing game. Because, honestly, I love playing games. You know, if somebody actually has to sit me down and, and you know, forcing me to play games is not a torture, right? In fact, this weekend coming up, we're going to a, a convention here called Game Hole Con. That's yeah, game hole, right? game hole. Uh, which is a fantastic little convention here in Wisconsin. I say little, it started out small. It's actually gotten to be uh, probably the largest regional convention in the Midwest. And they treat their guests like gold. They're fantastic people. It's Alex Cameron, Andrew Hitchcock, and the whole crew there. Uh, they fly people in from around the country to be special guests. They do a lot of stuff for charity. I'm going to be playing an Aliens game on Sunday, Saturday morning to oh, benefit. Wow. Uh, wow. What, which one is it? Child's Play? I think it's Child's Play. Um, 
The one where you put games, video game consoles into hospitals. That's where we're child's play. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Um, I've got to work with them too. They're great. Exactly. Great charity. Uh, And so we're going to be doing a live stream of that. And Marty and I are going to be playing two hour demos of shotguns and sorcery all weekend, just to make sure that people get a chance to test the the setting out to see how we melded it with Dungeons and Dragons and to have some fun with that. Man, everything got dark. You can tell it actually got dark outside because what happened is my monitor actually said, oh, it's time for dark. Now. Dark mode. Exactly. <laughs> no, I Dark did, mode I, kicked in. <laughs> I got it. I recently moved to North Carolina up in the mountains. And um, mm. now when it gets dark, I'm like being in the city, it's dark. Yeah, exactly. Like I look out and I'm like, there's blackness. There's nothing outside the window at this moment in time. <laughs> well, it sounds so, like fun. You know? it, it is. I, I woke up today. It was 40 degrees outside. I was in heaven been living in florida for 20 years and i was like so sick hey, of we had our first day of fall it went down to a whole 70 in the, at night so you know the lonely uh we're, we're in our 11th month of august so it's all good so yeah, we, we've had years here where we've had uh negative 100 degree wind chills in the middle of december right so oh no i remember living in wisconsin yep. oh. <laughs> my my mom actually with the house we lived in was one block from where they would not pick you up with the school bus. Even in the winter, it was one block. And I was like, so here's these kids from California. I remember walking out one time and there were steps outside the house and it was just white. Like you couldn't see the steps. It was just white. And this is a small town in Wisconsin. So small towns in Wisconsin, they're not like cleaning the roads and the sidewalks and you know, like they're, oh no. No, and I remember walking out and I walked out, turned right back around and went, nope, I'm not going. There's no way. There's no nope way. right out of it. <laughs> nope, I'm taking a snow day. I don't care if it's a real snow day. I am not going. It a is personal not snow happening. Day is fine. Yeah, my wife's but, from the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is even colder than we have in Wisconsin. Yeah. Like they don't even they don't even plow the roads until there's six inches of snow on the ground, right? Yep. What part of the UP are you from? Uh, I, I Well, I've lived in Dearborn for a little while and then uh, went way up uh well, a place called manitok up there and it's yep. not manitok there yep. manitok michigan and uh that was i was way young then so i barely remember but i remember blizzard of 77 very well because i know we couldn't open our front door of our house for two months it was yeah, exactly <laughs> right now there was one summer there was one christmas i was up there and they'd already had 20 feet of snow right and yep. it actually packs down but like you could not see out of the top you could see only out of the top half of the first floor's windows yeah, that's it. We house. have to go out the first floor, the second floor window to go to the yeah, grocery store. Exactly. So, yeah, you would crazy. climb out your second floor and dig down to the, where they had plowed the roads, but you couldn't get from your house to the road. Right. It's just tunnels everywhere. Right? Yeah, exactly. It was amazing. Almost like Dungeons and Dragons, kid. right? <laughs> that was that was what I was playing. Yeah, I was exactly. I was like, this is great. I'm, oh. Dungeons and Dragons on Hoth. Like yep. that's what that, that was. That was exactly. my two yeah. go-tos at the time. Yeah, this was pre-Hoth. So this is 77, so. Okay, so Matt, um, you're a gamer. What kind of characters do you like to play? I'll play just about anything. Usually when I'm playing a game, it's uh, I'll admit as a game designer, I'm a terrible game player, right? Because usually what I do is I show up, I play a game, I pick it apart in my head and I move on to the next thing. So uh, like I'll play Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder or whatever with my kids at every convention we go to. I'm usually like, just give me a fighter. You know, I'm, I'm here to kill things. Um but, you know, I used to play a cleric back when I was a kid quite a bit because, uh, you know, you're a utility player then. Everybody wants to be friends with the cleric after the first battle, right? Um, so you're, you're, you're well used. And you know, plus, I was uh, raised in a Catholic school. It's like, well, I'll be the cleric. And, <laughs> <I'll mess with laughs> so, um, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. But, yeah, I'll play just about anything like the Aliens game. I don't even know what the hell I'm going to be playing the Aliens game. I assume I'm going to die, right? Because it's an Aliens game. Well, um, it depends on whether or not it's one of those ones where you get to be the alien, the predator, or the human. Yeah, and exactly. it on I assume it's bad with. news for me either way, to be honest with you. But as long as you're working for Wayland Utani, you're good. So. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> that, that you get plot armor then if you're lucky. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Then, then um, at least you're good till the end. Exactly. So at least you make it to the end of the game. So yeah. We can hope. <laughs> We can hope, but yeah, it's uh, you know, I'll play just about anything. I, but again, I, I almost never stick around to be good at a game because I'm usually I play the game, I figure out how it works. I'm like, oh, now and I dissect it literally, I'm vivisection, and I'm like, okay, now I know how it works. I'm ready for the next thing. My kids get really good at games because they'll sit there and play the same thing over and over or whatever. And I'm like, you can kick my ass, guys. It's okay. <laughs> it's well, I think your perspective would ab- absolutely lend itself though to 
doing really well. I mean, we were joking earlier in the podcast about first edition and, you know, second edition D and D and some of the rules and stuff, but there, you know, when you get a, a gaming system and I'm just going to, I'm going to call this out because I I've said it before. I hate GURPS. Like, I feel like it takes for fucking oh. ever to fucking play GURPS. And I played so many role-playing games, oh. like, but fuck GURPS. Like I saw it the other day in a, a little shop up here that has dice and all this other stuff. And of course I always want to buy dice. I'm very lucky. My boyfriend goes, you have 12 bags and you're not even playing right now. And I'm like, shut up. But <laughs> Uh, big giant bags of dice but I was there and I saw the GURPS thing and my daughter was like oh what's this I'm like don't touch it like so bad but it's it's interesting to me because being on the playing side versus the designing side and the like making the rules it would give you a very unique perspective because like players we can list all the stuff that was terrible about certain games you know what I mean and then but Gosh, I can't even think to start on how you do that. So when you did Shotgun's Sorcery, did, is it based more like D&D or is it on the Cypher system? Where did you go with that? Well, originally it was a D&D product, right, in my head. And then it was a narrative thing. So I was just like, well, this is how I want it to work. This is how it's going to work. And then when we did the Cypher system, the Cypher system's actually got this little uh, neat little magic uh, magic item economy going on. We get these little tiny things called ciphers, which are basically uh, quick use magic items, right? But you would use them like you would use chewing gum, right? You just you don't keep them around for whatever. They're not like artifact, like the sword of my father's father, whatever. It's none of that shit. It's just like I, I'm going to take this, use this, take this, use this, and you keep uh, cycling through them. D and D doesn't work that way, although it does have some of that going on, right? This was leaning into that pretty hard. Um, so we included a lot of that stuff for the, uh, for the cypher system game. And then when we did the D and D game, we kind of had to root some of that out of there. Right. Cause we're like, okay, this is now canon for the, for the world, but we're going to have to do the D and D version of this, which are you know more permanent, more lasting, all that kind of stuff. Um, so there is a little bit of blend that way. I mean, it's interesting doing this kind of stuff. When I was doing, I did a series of books called the Knights of the Silver Dragon, which was the first uh, chapter book or YA series for Dungeons and Dragons back in uh, like 2004 or something like that, 2005. And uh, when I was coming up with it, I'm like, you know, I wanted to have this effect happen in the game. And there was not a spell for it in third edition. I'm like, I, I wrote my editor, I said, this is what's going to happen. And if you need me to write the magic item for you, I will do that. And you can publish it separately on, on Dragon Magazine or whatever else as a special magic item. But I need this particular thing this is how it works. I'd actually designed the game mechanics for it, right? I'm like, great. You know, it's because that, that was a little bit of the benefits that I, because I knew the system so well, I could basically reverse engineer it to whatever I needed narratively as well. And uh, so I didn't feel constrained by whatever was already there in print for the game. Um, you know, I know a lot of the the uh, the different novelists for Dungeons and Dragons over the years, like Bob Salvatore, Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman, Ed Greenman. These are all old friends of mine, right? Um, and, you know, the one thing you always want to do when you're doing this, you never want to be able to have people hear the dice rattling in the background as they're reading a book, right? It should feel natural. It should feel like it's a story, like it's a narrative, not like they suddenly stepped into a game. Now, there's a whole other uh, genre now that's called lit RPG, yeah. right? Or, uh, which people actually take the, the game mechanics from mostly video games and transpose that into the fiction. And you know, the breeder, mostly younger readers are like, that's really cool. I understand this. This is how it works. But for most readers, especially those who come from traditional fiction, the idea that you would actually have somebody roll something or there was a percentage chance of something just sticks in your cross up and horrible, right? So you always try to focus on that narrative more than anything else. And, um, and honestly, when you're doing the game design, then you're like, okay, how do I make this so it feels natural? So it's not just like a bolt on. It's not, you know, this is a lightning bolt you're firing. It's not just 66 damage. Right. No. Should never, you're not like, oh, this is just a damage number. Well, yeah. sure. I mean, but you know, what's the difference between the fireball and the lightning bolt? Well, we have mechanics that explain why they're different, but narratively, they're entirely different things. And you know how they work. So the mechanics have to reinforce that that sense of uh, what you think these are going to be, that you intuitively think a fireball should do versus what a lightning bolt does. Right. And hopefully those things all dovetail together into something nicely that works both narratively and mechanically as you're developing these things for games. And that's something we always strive for whatever game I'm working on. 
No, that's and I think that's awesome. I, I do see though that it's like behind the curtain in Wizard of Oz. And so when you're playing, you're a little like, okay. I do have a, um what has been your favorite game to play though? Oh man, I love all sorts of games. Um that's a good question. Uh for tabletop games, I played the crap out of Settlers of Catan. I actually worked with the guys there for a while on that on that stuff. Um we play a lot of Betrayal Legacy here at my house. We played the whole thing. Yeah. Betrayal at House on the Hill, we played the hell out of it. Uh, my kids just really got into it. Um, we started out playing Munchkin. Uh, John Kavalik is an old-time friend of mine. I've known John for 20-some uh, years. And he lives in Madison, which is just north of me. John does all the illustrations for Munchkin. He also does a wonderful comic strip called Dork Tower. Yeah. And he did Apples to Apple, or, uh, all sorts of different games, right? And uh, my kids and I were actually, uh, when they were very young, it was uh, in 2010, we were protesting, we we're also a little bit politically motivated, but we were protesting Act 10, which was breaking the unions for the educate for the teachers unions and such here in Wisconsin. We were marching around the Capitol at Wisconsin with my kids who were nine years old at the time. The quads were, Marty was 12. And uh, John had an office on the square. So he actually walked out and gave me a copy of Super Munchkin. And the kids have been playing Munchkin ever since then. Uh, the problem is when you're nine years old, you don't understand that it's okay if your friend stabs you in the back for a game. It becomes, it's a blood duel, God damn it! You are throwing down right here. So um, <laughs> I ended up moving them over to cooperative games instead, things like Forbidden Island and Pandemic. And and even, uh, but, and the neat thing about Betrayal at House on the Hill is actually it's a cooperative game up until a point, and then one person becomes the traitor. And then you have to figure out what you're going to do with them, right? So it's fun that you get to work together and move against them. Um and it, we actually had this tradition at Gen Con. Uh, my friend Andrew Hacker just passed away this year. And Andrew was the Munchkin czar for uh, Steve Jackson games. Uh, uh, had some stuff to do with GURPS. I'm not going to hold that against him because he's a good guy. Oh, my uh, God, GURPS. Um, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but Andrew uh, was the guy who wrote most of the jokes and a lot of the rules for Munchkin for years. When I was bringing the quads to Gen Con for the first time about 10 years ago, uh, he said, Bring your kids by uh, on Sunday at noon and we will play Munchkin. We're going to play the preview of whatever has not been put out yet. You know, the, whatever we play, we're going to play that and you know, we'll have a great time. So we, we took two hours to play Munchkin that Sunday. Steve Jackson came in, signed some stuff for him. He treated him like, well, like royalty. And then they had such a great time that Andrew did it every year after that. Right. He did it every every Gen Con. I would uh, he would ping me or I'd ping him and I'd say, Andrew, you don't have to do this. Right. And I understand if you got more important shit to do, it's Gen Con, it's a big show. And he's like, no, no, no. And I, I talked to the people at, at Steve Jackson, like uh, Andrew, when he was setting up a schedule for Gen Con, would always say, whatever you do, Sunday at noon, I'm busy with the Forbex. And so, you know, until he, until the pandemic happened, we didn't get to do it last year. Then he passed away this year from uh, glioblastoma, terrible brain cancer. Oh, uh, which wow. also had taken another friend of mine, uh, Jeff McIntosh, from the gaming industry a few years before that. Mm. Um, but we played with Andrew every year, and it's just amazing fun. Such a great friend, such a great guy. So, uh, and his family had a memorial service with him at Gen Con, and um, all my kids but one were able to show up. We actually played Munchkin there at his memorial service for him, just like he asked us to do. Nice. So, oh, that is really sweet, and that's nice. Um, are you a big, big video gamer at all? I'm a huge video gamer. Um, uh, I love video games. I've been playing them since I was a kid. Uh, my first system was an Intellivision. Um, yeah, I know uh, exactly I'd, what that is. I'd steal my ki my friend's Atari systems and ColecoVision systems and all that kind of shit. Uh, these days, I've been playing Yakuza or the Yakuza games, which are uh, just released on the Xbox Game Pass this year. So for the first time ever, they've been available on the Xbox. And I've been an Xbox guy for a long time. Um, so I'm like, I've been playing through from Yakuza zero all the way through. I'm up to six now. So nice. it's like the year of Yakuza for me. Um, but you know, I started out, uh, I, I started out when I moved back to Wisconsin, I actually interviewed with Bungie for uh, a gig writing for one of their fantasy games. I didn't get it. And I ended up going to a guy named John Scott Tynes, who's now one of the people in charge of Dungeons and Dragons after having spent 20 years at Microsoft. And, wow. uh, when I was there, they actually showed me a preview of Halo uh, a year and a half before it came out, but yeah, before they'd even been purchased by Microsoft. I was like, holy shit. So I've been playing Halo since then. So when I got the opportunity to write Halo novels, I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm writing Halo novels. Um, and I just, I uh, just have a great time. That's actually my go-to game for first person shooters to play with kids as their first FPS, right? Because it's, uh, you're fighting aliens. It's, the blood is bright glowing purple. 
Uh, and it also has couch co-op, right? So I can sit next to my kid. We can each have our own part of the screen we're playing on. And if they start getting flipped out, I can haul it back. I'm right there with them the entire time. Or if they start getting like really excited about it, I can haul them back either, you know, either way. Um, so I, it, I think it's just a brilliant game in a lot of ways to be able to start out for those first person shooter games. But uh, even back when I was running Pinnacle, we used to have a land set up where we would play things like Duke Nukem and, uh, and Unreal Engine and uh, God, what was the uh, Interstate 76 and things like this. Yeah, so that was a classic. Right. Uh, the last fact, we, land party we played Neverwinter Nights. There, were there we go. Us. Yeah, we would yeah. actually take off early every Friday. We'd buy a couple cases of beer and do land party until everybody had had enough to drink and you know had a ride home and were safe and all that good stuff. But yes, um, but that was back in the days in uh, in Blacksburg, Virginia, when we were running the company down there. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. I explained the land yeah. party to my son. He's twenty four now. But I was talking about this and I was explaining when the new Neverwinter Nights came out, I was like, oh my gosh, well, we used to land party this. And he's like, what? And when I explain these things, it's hysterical because I made gamers out of my kids as well. But right. when I explain like what we did in bringing the towers, because it wasn't laptops, it was towers and monitors. Oh. It was like a whole yeah. thing. And he had, and he's like, that seems like a lot of work. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> us early gamers put in a lot of work. Yeah, that was like two or three trips back from the car, dude. You know, that wasn't like <laughs> pop your laptop open. You know, it's, it's some serious shit. Yeah, um, yeah my, my son Patrick is actually studying game design up at UW Stout. I actually taught a game design class at UW Stout for video game design last term because they were shy a teacher for two-dimensional game design. Like, uh, I think it was game design 325. And my friend Jeff Tidball was going to be teaching there. Jay, uh, Jay Little has been teaching there for like eight years. He was a big fantasy flight game designer for many years. And they had recommended me for the gig. And I'm like, I don't even know if I want to do this. But my son's going to school here. I want to support the school. I think it'll just be fun. So I taught one course for one term. And I got to be called Professor Forbeck because I was teaching these kids how to actually do real game design for video games. And it was a blast, right? It was really neat watching them come to the stuff together. But Pat actually... Uh, gets out of his, his uh, dorm room occasionally for land parties. Like they actually bring their machines down to the student union and hook them together. And they, you know, no internet involved, just hook them up to a router and, you know, kick each other's asses for a while and have a good time. So, so kids still apparently know how to do this. It's just not very common. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, th I, there was, it, there's a big difference. It's kind of like the difference between playing online games like wow and stuff like that. Don't get me wrong. I did that made quite a bit of money making characters on EverQuest. I'm not going to lie about that until Sony figured that shit out yep. um, um, and shut eBay down. Made a lot of money. I but um, <laughs> the, the thing about that is that, you know, it's very different and the world's different from when we were younger and you, you were playing with each other to play a two-player game. It wasn't over a thing. Like you, you had to be lucky enough to get it. And most of that was in arcades because they had more two-player games than a lot of yep. the systems had. Yeah. And, you know, I that's okay. I took my kids. I'm like, let me introduce you to the original Gauntlet. And they were like, <laughs> you played this? And I'm like, for hours and oh, hours. God. Yeah, my friends and I in college, we would go to the arcade with a roll of quarters each and sit down and play Gauntlet for fucking ever, oh, right? God. And we had a blast. Like, warrior needs food, right? That was all that we would ever hear yep. for days afterwards. But uh, yeah, it was just so much fun, right? And then you're just, and you slap the guy next to you like, no, you don't do that, blah, blah, blah. And we, we just, just too much fun. Shane and I used to play House of the Dead at a local arcade when we were running Pinnacle too. Our local awesome. movie theater had House of the Dead up there, which is one of these laser pistol, uh, web, you know, zombie shooters. And we just had a ball with that. You know, it's a rail shooter, so you're not exactly moving around a lot. But one it's of like, the worst translated videos ever too, because the audio is just, oh, it's, oh, so it's terrible. terrible. But we endured it. Yeah, what else did you have at the time, right? Oh, I know. It was great. I was, we used to play the uh, six-player X-Men game. That was our go-to because you know, whoever got stuck with Dazzler was whoever showed up last. You know, but it was <laughs> it was always fun. But that was because uh, Nightcrawler was just so OP in that game. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that was – and it was always – and again, terrible translation. You know, you, oh, God. you will be the one escaping. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> What? <laughs> No, uh, that was that was it. And back then, we didn't care. That was the thing. We were like, "This is the coolest thing ever!" Oh yeah, Mike Demoria. Halo Lands before Xbox Live. The first Halo we used to do every Christmas. We would have everybody bring their Xbox, and we'd. My house was hardwired for Ethernet. I was the first house to do that in my nice. entire 
area. And so it's still hardwired for Ethernet. And that's why I didn't even do Wi Fi till recently. Uh, yeah. But it's, um, uh, but we used to, we would have different rooms and the four different players on each one. So we had 16 player Halo matches before Xbox Live. And it was, uh, those are insane. I'll, I'll never forget from other rooms screaming at each other. You know, it was, it was oh, just, it was land party. Yeah. But. Oh God. Yeah. When we were doing Duke Nukem Forever, it was basically rocket pack, rocket launch, jet pack, rocket launcher battles, right? Yep. <laughs> crazy, crazy shit. Or it was a lot of it was all about making the levels because they're like one of the easiest level editors ever. And it's exactly yeah. yeah. Most of the games I play nowadays on on uh for video games or single player games, right? I don't do a whole lot of uh of uh group stuff. My sons, my kids do a lot of that stuff, they really enjoy it. But uh, you know, I'm like, I don't have a whole lot of time. I don't really want to and you know, I get interrupted constantly. So I'm just here to do Twitch gaming essentially for a second, not Twitch like Twitch, but like I need to, you know, it's all about reaction time and everything else. And of course, uh, now that I'm 53, they, these kids can kick my ass. I'm not as quick as I used to be. Um, and it, but it's always good fun. And for me, that's a different part of my brain than I use for narrative stuff, right? Or even for mechanical stuff. It's just uh, like, okay, I'm just teleporting my brain into this body in another place and moving without even thinking about where my thumbs are or anything else. And I have a blast doing it. The, the Yakuza games have been great for this kind of stuff. They're actually the kind of games I really like writing even because they have these uh, great battle systems and everything else. But then the stories and the side stories and the sub stories and everything else are just entertaining as shit. They're amazing, right? Um, and sometimes these things cross over. It was actually just announced I'm working on a game called uh, Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, which is a, uh, a mobile game. So it's played on iPhones and Android phones, or whatever else. But it's basically Warhammer 40,000 with a little tactical combat game. And I'm writing the storyline for each one of the, uh, the missions that go, the, the campaigns that happens for that. So that's just a kick and a half to be able to do that kind of stuff too. Fantastic. That's very, very cool. Okay. I cannot believe we've come to the end of our podcast right now. So I will ask you, what advice do you have for authors out there? I would say stick to it. Uh, you know, um, Perse perseverance is probably the most important thing you're going to have, right? The other thing is when you finish your first book, don't stop writing. A lot of people think they only got one book in them and they will stop after their first book and they'll shop it around and then think, well, nobody recognized my genius. So therefore, uh, fuck them all. I'm going off in the woods and I'm going to burn a copy of this and we'll never see it again. And screw you all. Um, but what they really should be doing is honestly, your first book probably sucks. Right. Everybody's it's like the first carpenter. If you're a carpenter, the first table you build sucks. If you're a rock star, the first song you made sucks. It just does. You're learning as you go along. Right. So move on to the second book, the third book, the fourth book. You can go pitch those other books. But then when they don't sell, you'll have your second, your third or fourth book to go. And then you can it, it might be your fourth or fifth book or whatever that actually sells. And then your editor will say, do you have anything else? And you'll say, well, let me show you what I got over here, right? And they'll say, well, these are kind of shit. But since I trust you now, because you're a good writer, you can fix these and we'll make them better. And then we can sell these too. So just don't stop. It, it, don't just do the one book and just walk away, right? If you really want to be a writer, you need to learn how to enjoy the process of it. You need to want to actually write more than you want to be a writer, if that makes sense, right? I know a lot of people want to have written and be a writer, but they don't actually enjoy the process of writing. But if you can actually find some pleasure in the actual process of it, then the rest of it is just gravy after that. You know? And that helps you persevere because it's not a struggle. You're not hating yourself the entire time you're actually writing. You're actually enjoying yourself. And the rest of those are just the fruits of your labor. Very cool. And then one more amazing plug for this banner behind you, my mm -hmm. friend. Go to shotgunsnsorcery.com. Sign up for the Kickstarter. Uh, if it's already launched by the time this goes out, great. Just join in and uh, click pledge. Give me all my money and all that kind of stuff. I'd really appreciate it. My son would appreciate it. I got four kids in well, I got three kids in college right now and another is a volunteer for AmeriCorps. So we have bills to pay, folks. Get those things out there. And it's <laughs> an amazing game and fun to play. So besides... Oh, you're going to get plenty for your money, folks. There's no doubt there. <laughs> I, I've got 32 years of experience doing 34 years, whatever experience doing this stuff. My first publication that I did this kind of stuff with, I actually had a, uh, a fanzine I published when I was in high school at 16 years old. I had my own booth at Gen Con when I was 17. I've been doing this a goddamn long time and I adore this stuff. And I'm as much of a fan as anybody else and as much of a gamer as anybody else. So when I say I'm trying to, to sell you a game, it's because I want to share something with you that I already love and excited about. And I hope you'll be as excited about it as I am. 
Absolutely. And the link will be in the podcast and it will be put on drinking with authors as well. So you guys can check out the Kickstarter, which will be amazing. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you again, Matt, for being on the podcast. You've been absolutely delightful. I appreciate it. I will take any excuse to drink with cool people I ever get, right? That's my other secret for networking, right? (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Hey, I, I do a lot of networking. A lot of networking. <laughs> That's what we're going to call it. We're going to call it that for now on. Hey, it's all networking. networking. This is networking with right authors. Good. Yes. <laughs> do a lot of networking with authors, but thank you so much for being on the podcast. I've been your host, Erica Lance. My co-host has been Mark Muncie from at Erie, Florida. Awesome. And we will see you guys next time. <laughs>